Tenemos eh, pocas ocasiones en las que aparecen startups realmente sorprendentes, que son capaces de, de cambiar sus modelos de negocio o de crear eh, nuevos. ¿no? Y, y Airbnb es una de ellas. Eh, lo que, como comunidad que son en estos momentos, una comunidad en la que eres capaz de alquilar no solo apartamentos, sino pisos, eh, barcos, castillos, islas, mansiones de repente han dado la vuelta a una forma de cómo estamos abriendo la puerta de nuestras casas hacia, hacia, otros, hacia otros usuarios. En solo tres años han sido capaces de tener en estos momentos 19.000 ciudades representadas, más de 190 países, más de 120.000 eh, 120 propiedades que están disponibles para los usuarios. Y lo sorprendente de esto es que hay datos realmente curiosos, como... Saber que hoy, la noche de hoy, en Nueva York, dormirán en gente, en, en eh, apartamentos de usuarios de Airbnb, más gente que en el mayor de los hoteles de la ciudad. Yo soy Antonio Mas y hoy tengo el placer de, de, presentador, de presentar a Christopher Lukezic. Christopher es el responsable de comunicación de Airbnb y, y nos va a contar cómo han conseguido... Eh, ser una de estas empresas que ha conseguido posicionarse en ese reducido club de las valoraciones superiores a los eh, mil millones de dólares, donde hay solo pocas como Twitter, como Facebook o Inga. Pero también eh, lo que nos va a contar es cómo somos capaces de construir una comunidad eh, para transmitir la confianza que los usuarios puedan eh, disfrutar y abrir las puertas a otros usuarios. Cristo. <laughs> I hope he was saying nice things about me. So um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here in Madrid. Um, and, and today I want to share with you uh, some of the lessons that we've learned as a company um, over time, uh, a lot of them in hindsight. Um, and a lot of them sort of uh, will be beneficial to anyone who is um, a part of what is emerging as a, this environment of uh, what we call collaborative consumption, or um, as we often refer to at Airbnb as a, a sh the, the emergence of a, a sharing economy. Um, so if, if the dot-com era was defined by the emergence of, of, of e-commerce and the ability to buy and, and sell goods online, um, and Web 2.0 was defined by uh, the emergence of uh, the social internet, uh, I think that the, next, uh, the future of the internet is in the emergence of, of the collaborative internet. Um, and I mean that not only through consumption, um, which is the, the sort of the economy that we're pioneering and emerging in, um, but also with uh, things like media and with knowledge. So you have um, YouTube, for instance, is a very collaborative environment. Uh, you have Wikipedia, which is probably the world's best example of knowledge sharing. Um, and so today I want to walk you through that. So um, I'm Christopher. Uh, I joined the company uh, a little over two years ago in the summer of 2009. Um, originally moved to San Francisco uh, to launch my own company. Um, I met the founders of Airbnb and I realized very, very early on, I've been following the company basically since its inception in uh, the fall of 2008. Uh, I emailed the founders and got to know them a bit and actually sent them an email. I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from the email, um, which is why I decided to forego doing my own business uh, in order to join what I think is one of the, you know, uh, going to be one of the most important companies um, to emerge uh, in this decade and hopefully uh, into the future. Uh, the excerpt that I wrote to the, the founders is this, and this was in, I think, August of 2009. Airbnb has the ability to foster an open marketplace where a focus on transparency, trust, and user experience will allow people to begin trading and sharing in ways the world has never dreamed of. Above all, Airbnb is going to help us all to rethink our notions of community, both in the digital and the offline worlds, at both the local and the global levels. That's something that I think is sort of held true since I have my time of being Airbnb, and it's something that we live by day in and day out, that we really think that we're pioneering and doing something new, but that it's not about us, it's about our community. Um, and that's a sort of a lesson we've learned that's tried and true and holds fast. So let's begin. How many of you own one of these? A car, raise your hands. Okay. How many of you enjoy doing this? Do you own, it, who here owns a car because they, uh, they like working on their engine? No one. What you, what you own a car for is to drive it. Um, you, know, you, you need a car because it provides transport for you. You don't own a car because you enjoy doing this. And this is, unfortunately, uh, one of the joys of ownership. Um, what you really need is access to a car. You want to be able to drive the car when you want it. 
what we've seen over time is the emergence of companies like Zipcar um, that give you access to the car when you need it, by the hour uh, or by the day. Um, this is something that's been profound and it's something that's emerging now. You have Zipcar and a few other car sharing companies around the world. Um, what we're starting to see now is Zipcar sort of pioneered a space of, of access. Um, they're giving you access to a car when you need it and a car when you want it. Um, what they don't give you is the ability to put your own car on, online. So you're seeing here is one side of what we call uh, the sharing economy, which is we collectively as people can rent a, a zip car whenever we want. Um, what I find interesting is that now you see corporations getting in the same game. Um, you have entrepreneurs who start companies like Zipcar, and you have a big industry now reacting to um, the emergence of this sort of collaborative economy. Um, BMW earlier this year announced uh, Drive Now, which is their version of Zipcar. And soon to follow, because if BMW does something, Daimler, of course, has to follow. Uh, Daimler uh, and Mercedes have also launched um, their version of Zipcar. Um, I think this is now in four cities around the world, Amsterdam, uh, Hamburg, uh, Austin, Texas, and I think Frankfurt. Um, what you're seeing here is essentially you know, one side of what we call uh, the, sort of the sharing economy, that we're all able to share a single asset. Um, the powerful thing about the sharing economy and the emergence of it is the ability to come to the other side. That fundamental to the sharing economy and the emergence of collaborative consumption is the idea that access is more important than ownership. But access has two sides. Before companies like Get Around existed or Relay Rides and a number of others that are now emerging, you couldn't rent your car out to your neighbor. Uh, you couldn't provide access to them. Now you can. So the access economy and this, this sort of the ability to share goods has to be two-sided. It can't be just um, the assets that are being shared and someone's using it. You have to give people who own the assets the ability to share them with others as well. So what you see here is essentially is this. Beyond that, this is great. We call this sort of uh, the use of a commodity. None of us think of a, a car as something um, that's an experience, unless, of course, this was a Ferrari. Um, but it's very unlikely that your neighbor is going to rent out his Ferrari to you. Uh, but what we like to see is, you know, what we've watched and seen evolve over time, and I think the reason that Airbnb has been so successful is because providing something other than just a commodity. It's no longer about sharing commodities, it's about getting to a level of experience. So what we have here is a quintessential view of San Francisco. And this is probably a photograph every single person in this room has seen at some point, and anyone who's visited San Francisco has probably gone to take this same photograph. Well, these are the, called the Painted Ladies. Um, and you can actually rent one of the Painted Ladies on Airbnb. So what happened before with the, the sharing economy and the emergence of, of companies like Zipcar um, and others is that you were getting a commodity. You were able to, to kind of trade a commodity with someone. Now you're actually able to have an experience. So this emergence in sort of this fundamental belief that access is greater than ownership um, is not only about the commodity exchange, it's also about the access. The power drill. Many of you in this room probably own a power drill. Um, Rachel Botsman, who's probably the, the, the single you know, biggest thought leader in the collaborative consumption space, who's author of a book called uh, What's Mine is Yours, um, when she was doing the research to write the book, she came across an interesting stat that the average power drill and the life of its use in ownership is only used for 12 minutes. And many of us probably own a power drill and use it far less than 12 minutes. Um, I, I am guilty of the same thing. So what we're seeing is the ability to take um, otherwise underutilized assets and put them to work. And you're only able to do this by building marketplaces that bring people together. Uh, and when you do that, you start to undermine existing economies. Um, you start to undermine you know, uh, traditional retailers. Because now, uh, you no longer have to go and buy the power drill from your local hardware store. You can just rent it from your neighbor. How did we get to this, this, this place? Um, the way we like to think about Airbnb is that we came along at the right time. We got very lucky as a company. Um, none of us will say that we planned this ahead of time. Um, at first, it's the emergence of the internet. We had to bring people online and give them access to the internet. And over time, that adoption has swelled. And now every single person in this room and almost every single person that we know spends the majority of their day somehow connected to the internet, either via their mobile phone or at their desk. Then we saw the emergence of places online where you could trade goods. Craigslist is probably the grandfather of collaborative consumption and probably still the most important um, single website in this emerging economy because it's allowing people to use the internet uh, to trade goods. Then you had eBay come along. 
eBay did very much the similar thing to, to Craigslist, but it took it from a local level and actually made it global. So what it did was connect people globally uh, through the ability to uh, buy and share goods from each other. Then you had services like Napster, which were around collaboration around a specific topic and the sharing of files across the internet. You're getting into the digital collaboration space. Then people had to get really comfortable paying online. This was something I can still remember my mother um, the first time I wanted to buy something online, um, asking her to use a credit card, and she said, no, you know, someone will steal the credit card number and um, we'll, we'll be out of money. Uh, people over time had to get comfortable paying online and transacting with strangers they've never met before. Um, this is sort of fundamental to the ability for sort of the sharing economy to emerge and to happen. Um, and finally, we get into the social web. And the social web has completely transformed all of our lives because a lot of the communication that we have with each other, um, both in the communities that we live in day in and day out, as well as the communities of friends that we have around the world, happens through networks like Facebook. Um, and Facebook has really kind of brought our lives online as well as offline. And it's basically blurred that, uh, that barrier. And then we get to Airbnb. And, you know, simply put, we emerged at the right place at the right time when all of these forces came together and allowed our business model to be adopted by people. Um, and early on, you know, it wasn't adopted by many. Uh, what we can see now is, as we've sort of pioneered this space, we've given other people the ability to, uh, to start to, to look at all the other assets they own in their home and monetize those. Interesting statistic here, and this is where you can start to see the power of collaborative consumption, is that the average New Yorker who rents their place on Airbnb full-time makes $21,000 a year. Um, very simply put, this is a very empowering business model that's empowering people, you know, uh, basically at the most local level you possibly can. Uh, it's in their living rooms. But the genesis of this idea didn't happen overnight. It wasn't something that we as a company had planned to do. Uh, and the learnings that we sort of accrued over time um, are what I want to share with you today. So simply put, the genesis for, for Airbnb and the reason that we came into existence is due to this, an air mattress. Um, it's due to three designers in San Francisco who couldn't pay the rent. And they decided to rent out an air mattress to fellow designers coming to town for a conference. That's, this literally was our, uh, our office up until 14 months ago, um, and also was where the company was founded. So, um, and these are the three initial guests on Airbnb. And what happened is, very simply put, the interaction that the founders and, and these three guests had um, blew their mind, because what happened was initially to solve a problem, was to make the rent and to rent out some air mattresses. But what happened was this experience that they had with these people. And they came together and basically communed and kind of made it a small community. Granted, there's only six people in an apartment, but they've remained friends with, with, with Kat, Amol, and Michael over time. And that's actually not Michael, by the way. Um, we don't have a photo of him, so we use a stock photo. Um, but that, that is Kat and Amol, and they're all designers. Um, and none of them fit the stereotype of the people that we thought were going to use Airbnb early on. And to this day, the typical Airbnb user and the majority of our users are actually females um, between the ages of 35 and 45. Not your, typical, uh, not your typical demographic. In fact, there are more people 65 plus using Airbnb day in and day out than there are the 18 to 25 demographic. This is their initial home. This is the bed and breakfast that emerged. And this was called Air Bed and Breakfast, which is why we have uh, the name that is so hard to pronounce still. Um, and over time, that grew to this. now in 192 countries around the world. Um, Airbnb has, was an international company from day one. Not because we wanted to be an international company from day one, because that's what happened. Because our users started finding out about Airbnb from all over the world. And through the social web, started sharing Airbnb with their friends all over the world. And three years later, 192 countries. And I can tell you, uh, leading our, our marketing efforts, uh, we've done marketing in maybe a, a small percentage, maybe one, one to two percent of these 192 countries. What we can see is the power of this movement. Um, it's swelled over time to basically encompass most of the inhabitable Earth. In San Francisco, just to give you an example of sort of the saturation of how this uh, has emerged and how this sort of access economy um, has happened. If you go to San Francisco today and you want to stay in a hotel, um, you have a very small, uh, small area of the city that you can stay in. Um, it's in the upper right-hand corner of, of the map. Um, but what we can see over time is that Airbnbs now exist on nearly every single city block in San Francisco. 
that's pretty powerful because you no longer have to stay in the hotel district. You can actually go and stay in San Francisco and live just like someone who's from San Francisco. And that experience is really what the power of, uh, of Airbnb encompasses. So over time, this, this caught on. And we, you know, the adoption's been great, and we're very happy with the success. We have a long ways to go. And we've learned a lot of things, and we're now taking those learnings um, and pouring them back into our business and forward investing in, um, in our growth. So the one thing we have seen, which we're very flattered by, is we used to call ourselves the eBay of space. Uh, and now there have been over 25 companies in Silicon Valley alone um, that have pitched themselves to investors and gotten um, investment of a million dollars or more uh, pitching themselves as the Airbnb for something else. Um, it could be the Airbnb for dog walking, the Airbnb for food, the Airbnb for cars, the Airbnb for parking space, the Airbnb for gardening. Um, and we're very flattered to, to have that. And we feel a, you know, a responsibility to share our learnings with anyone who's in thinking about entering this space. Uh, because we think that this is actually uh, going to fundamentally change the world. It's going to change the way, not only the way people, uh, you know, what they consume, but how they consume. And that's a very powerful thing. If anyone here has gone to business school, you've probably encountered this at some point along your studies. I went to business school, and I very, you know, very much remember studying Porter's Five Forces. Porter's Five Forces are a great strategy and a great framework. But there's a reason that you don't see a lot of MBA students in San Francisco, um, in Silicon Valley, or anywhere in the world starting companies. It's simply put because you cannot use frameworks like this to make businesses that are innovative. Um, and frankly put, you know, we've sort of had to throw this away and rewrite this and figure out, well, what are the forces that, that guide Airbnb? What are the problems that we're trying to solve day in and day out that also would affect uh, other companies in this, uh, in this sharing economy? So these are them. One is the, the, the need to build trust. You're bringing people together from all over the world and you're trying to get them to share assets. Um, you're trying to get them to share their homes, their cars, um, their goods. Trust is central to that, um, whether it's through you know, uh, reputation-based systems, whether it's through you know, peer reviews. There are a number of ways that a company, whether it's through service as well, which is, is, is an important topic for us, um, trust is really the, the backbone that makes us work. We uh, have first-hand experience with this. A lot of you have probably read this summer, and a lot of the uh, people that I've talked to last night brought this up. And this became global news. When this, uh, earlier this summer, um, a host in San Francisco, in tragic and unfortunate incident, um, that the guest who was staying in her home trashed it, completely destroyed the interior of her home and stole a number of her possessions. Um, us as a company was devastating because we view the users of our, uh, of our business not as consumers. We see them as a community. Um, in which we're fully engaged with. They're not, um, they're not end users. We don't see them as people who uh, buy, buy a good and you know, the next day we, we count them as a figure. We see them as people who have come together in this community and we're there to harness that. So when something happens to someone in our community, we were personally devastated. Uh, and our response to that was to go above and beyond and to try and build the, the basically most trusted, safest platform that we possibly can. And that's actually become the number one uh, focus for our entire company um, on the product side is we need to do everything we can to build trust. Uh, and a lot of that is done th simply through customer service. But this entire economy exists on one fundamental, uh, one fundamental belief, is that people are generally good. Second, is that we don't see them as consumers. They're a community. Well, what does that mean? Well, early on in the company, we did things that weren't scalable. Um, when you have uh, no funding and you haven't raised any money, uh, traveling to New York and to Portland, into Miami and Chicago um, on a credit card, it's very expensive. And you start to question why you're doing this. Well, very simply put, it was to go and meet the people using our website. And we recognized that if we could build something that a few people wanted to use, they might tell their friends and they might use it. But more than that, we figured that we could build a business that supported this, which is something that most businesses up until Airbnb came along never did. Most businesses never cared about building a community of their users. And the reason we do that is to listen. It's to constantly build and to innovate by listening to your users. Uh, and you can only do that if they trust you and they want to engage with you in that way. So early on, we started to focus on community. And to this day, it's one of the primary focuses of our entire marketing effort. Uh, third is that we had to be an international business from day one. Um, it was haphazard. But, and I think if we could go back in time, we would have started internationalizing the site. Um, from day one, I think that we would have started to open offices, um, probably from day two. Uh, and we're doing that now, but granted, we're three years in, and we're just, uh, we've just opened our first international office in Germany. Um, and by the end of the year, we'll have offices in Italy, France, Spain, uh, Russia, Brazil, Australia, uh, and Italy. So 
Um, it's, it's too important for a company these days uh, to launch in its country and not to think about the global scale of its reach. Um, and for us, now the international um, aspect of our business is now 60%. This is a, an amazing infographic that we had made earlier this year. This is uh, travel trends from 2010 on Airbnb. This is where people um, basically came from and went to. Uh, and it's showing you the global scale and the global reach of, of our business. Third is that it's no longer about worrying about competition. Um, you know, if, if you have a successful internet business, and we've now seen this firsthand as a company, um, and it, your business is written in code, uh, and it doesn't matter what code it's written in. It could be Ruby, it could be C+, um, you know, it could be PHP. It doesn't matter. People can copy it like that. Overnight, you can have a clone. You can have five clones. In fact, we have about 15 or 20 clones. Last, uh, last thought. Some of them has gone so far as to take the photographs on our website, which I think they thought was stock photography, were actually photos of our employees, and put them on their website. Um, so very simply put, we can't as a company, and internet businesses in general, can't focus on competition. The only thing that you can focus on is innovation. And that's something that has to start from the, the foundation of the company um, and has to be, uh, you know, kind of core to the values of the company. Um, you know, there are uh, companies like IDEO um, that, you know, and McKinsey, the business is higher when they get very big and realize that they no longer know how to innovate. Um, you have to start from the very beginning and build innovation into the culture and the DNA of your workforce. Um, at Airbnb, risk is you know, uh, risk is encouraged. We've taken so many risks, but the times we've taken those risks, they've been calculated and the learnings that we've taken away from them have led to uh, features and enhancements like social connections, which has been one of our most well-received um, uh, features yet. Um, this is a photo of our office in San Francisco. We've actually designed all the meeting rooms to look uh, identical to uh, a few select listings uh, on our website. This one happens to be in Hong Kong. Just to give you an example of, uh, of, kind of how core innovation is to our company, is that we went back and looked at the design of our office when we were building basically what, what was our first, um, our first real office and wasn't in a garage or an apartment. Um, and we thought, how can we design a space that will foster innovation? Because we knew that we might be moving a little bit slower day in and day out, but that we would lead to big innovations which would sustain our business long term um, and that would help us overcome any competitive threat that, that, that emerged. Um, and so we did that basically by designing a space that um, fostered that innovation. It keeps people at the office. We have a chef full time. These are sort of investments that on the surface don't seem like you know, they make a lot of sense. But when you have people at the office for 14, 15 hours a day and it doesn't feel like work, uh, ideas emerge. And those ideas are really the gold and the, the sort of the, the heart of a company. Um, and when you're set to, you know, to build a company that will last for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, you have to put innovation at the forefront um, of your workforce. And finally, disruption. When you disrupt industries, you piss people off. They get very mad. Um, we'll see this with almost every single collaborative consumption uh, startup that comes out, whether it's Airbnb and we're going to face a threat from hotels um, because we're undermining their business, um, or we're going to see you know, uh, companies that are doing the, you know, the Airbnb for food. Um, they're they're going to see you know, regulations from uh, health departments. This is something where disruption you know, is, is always a good thing for society, but it's never done without, uh, without a fight. And it's never done, um, you know, uh, easily, I guess. Um, but we come back to sort of the second point up here, which is we've built a community of users. And the community of people are not us as a company. And that we fostered a community for a reason, because this is their product. And we view um, our product not as our website, but as our community. And it's constantly about engaging with them and building uh, the things that they need to live their lives better. So just to give you an example, this is a photograph of a Hilton in, a, in Paris. Um, I found it on the internet. It was taken by someone uh, on Flickr. And, you know, it's, it, it looks great if I was going to Paris. I don't think this is where I would want to stay. Um, I could stay uh, at an apartment or a, a hotel that looked like this. Um, in Nebraska, in the United States, it would look almost identical to this, and it would not be a Parisian experience. On Airbnb, you can book this. This is probably a quintessential you know, Parisian apartment. And if you've never been to Paris before, um, this is the experience that you want. And we're now making that accessible to people by bringing them together um, and providing a platform that makes that possible. And just to give you final, a final example of where disruption lies and why you know, it, is, it has to be a force and a factor that we as a company always pay heed to. 
um, but one that was ultimately good for the world, um, is that the Hilton Hotels, uh, hotel chain, which is the biggest hotel chain in the world, um, is right around 200,000 rooms. Airbnb, by, I think at this point, we have already eclipsed 200,000 um, rooms before the end of the year. This slide was made um, earlier this year. We've seen that we've actually eclipsed the Hilton Hotel. On any given night in New York City, there are more people staying on Airbnb than there are in the largest hotel in the city, which is the Hilton. Um, and worldwide, we think that very soon there'll be more people every single night around the world staying on Airbnb than in Hilton hotels. Um, and finally, just to close, you know, when we set out to, to sort of build Airbnb, none of this stuff was apparent to us when we began. Um, there are things that we've learned over time. And because we foster a culture of innovation, it's always a culture of, of critique and of understanding and always looking back and figuring out what we did right and what we've done wrong and how we're going to improve in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is it Q&A too, yeah? Yeah, okay. it's time to, for yeah. some questions. Okay. Bien, no sé si hay alguna pregunta. Bien, no sé si desde Twitter o eh, allí veo una. Si eres tan amable, creo que había un micrófono. Allí está. Just a quick question. Uh, where are you staying now here in Madrid? Uh, <laughs> good question. I'm actually staying in a hotel, and it's uh, it was it wasn't paid for by me. Uh, the conference has, has put me there, so um, and I, I kindly accepted uh, I kindly accepted their offer. Though uh, to tell you the truth, when I do travel for business, when any employee from Airbnb travels for business, um, and it's not paid for um, so kindly uh, by a conference, um, we all stay in uh, we all stay in Airbnb listings. In fact, we give all of our employees. A thousand dollars a year. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, anyone in the company. Thousand dollars a year to use the service day in and day out. Not everyone in the company gets to travel uh, as often as I do, um, but they don't get to experience our product day in and day out. Um, and we want them to because that feedback is important. But more than that, it's about engaging with the people um, who are our users. And when we send employees out to meet them and to stay with them, um, we learn more than we could uh, through any sort of market research or surveying that, that's possible. Uh, another question. Sorry. Eh, espero que le hayamos pagado la habitación en cualquier caso. ¿eh? I knew that question was coming. So. Yeah. I actually, I actually do use Airbnb. I, I rent a house of mine, um, and I actually had a not a be very good experience in the past, just because of the guest quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually read also your newsletter that came about two months ago with the problem you had in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you elaborate a little bit on the type of guarantees you're offering? Uh, the homeowners in this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, when uh, that incident happened, um, as a company, we sort of gathered around and you know, we knew we had to respond in some way. Um, and the way that we responded was to take two weeks um, and basically most of our employees were sleeping in at the office um, day in and day out. And for two weeks, um, we worked extremely hard to do a, a few things. One was that we launched 42 uh, improvements, upgrades, or new um, uh, features uh, to the website that improved um, trust and safety. Um, those were things like uh, verifying social profiles, verifying phone numbers, verifying home addresses, um, verifying user contact information, um, allowing people to call, uh, call through the website. Um, we uh, most importantly launched uh, what was the, in the US, the $50,000 guarantee, the 40,000 euro um, guarantee to a homeowner. Should anything happen to your home as a company, um, we've made a commitment to our community that will always be there to stand by them. Um, you know, the, the event that happened with um, EJ was the name of the host, um, was very unfortunate. And we can say, you know, that it definitely challenged, uh, it challenged our business and it challenged us as employees more than anything. And it, what it did was make us recommit um, you know, to the, to the community that we were always going to be there and we were always going to go above and beyond in the future to make sure that in the event of any instance like that, um, we were there for them. And we can say, though, that in, uh, in over three million nights book now, we've had only two incidences that were, um, you know, of similar nature. I was going to ask the same question the first person asked. Uh, but now that I have the mic, I just <laughs> want to let you know that Pablo Larguia, who's sitting on the front row, he's one of your main advocates and at <laughs> Redi Nova, which he's the president, he spoke of Airbnb to a, a huge theater full of people. And from that day, I, I've been talking about Airbnb because Pablo talked about it and he was so passionate about it. And it's just like from there, I've had friends that I told and friends that told other friends 
and it was amazing that he talked about it. So, you know, Pablo here on the first row, you, you, you might want to <laughs> talk you, to Pablo. him later. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> you will. <laughs> Let me, uh, which is the business model at Airbnb, and what is their $1 billion valuation based on? Okay. Yeah, so our business model basically functions um, uh, as a fee structure. Um, if you're a homeowner and you list your home or property on Airbnb, um, it's free to list on the service. Uh, we charge a 3% fee uh, to the homeowner any time that there's a reservation that happens to cover the transaction. Uh, on the other side of the equation, to the traveler, um, we charge a 6 to 12% fee um, that acts as a service fee um, and helps us provide customer support um, you know, to both the host and the, the, the traveler um, at all times. Um, our valuation is based on um, you know, strength of, uh, of revenue streams um, to date, as well as projected future revenue, um, as well as the, the addressable market that we're, we're in and the industry that we're in. Um, it's a massive industry, and we have an incredible team, and we're able to innovate um, better than any of our competitors. Okay. I think uh, yeah. we don't have more time. Muchas gracias. gracias. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. 19,000 cities represented, more than 190 countries, more than 120,000 propiedades que están disponibles para los usuarios. Y lo sorprendente de esto es que hay datos realmente curiosos, como saber que hoy, la noche de hoy, en Nueva York, dormirán en gente, en, en eh, apartamentos de usuarios de Airbnb, más gente que en el mayor de los hoteles de la ciudad. Yo soy Antonio Mas y hoy tengo el placer de, de, presentador, de presentar a Christopher Lukezic. Christopher es el responsable de comunicación de Airbnb y, y nos va a contar cómo han conseguido eh, ser them in hindsight um, and a lot of them sort of uh, will be beneficial to anyone who is um, a part of what is emerging as a this environment of uh, what we call collaborative consumption or um, as we often refer to at Airbnb as a, a the, the emergence of a, a sharing economy um, so if if the dot com era was defined by the emergence of, of, of e-commerce and the ability to buy and, and sell goods online. Um, and Web 2.0 is defined by uh, the emergence of uh, the social internet. Uh, I think that the next, uh, the future of the internet is in the emergence of, of the collaborative internet. Um, and I mean that not only through consumption, um, which is the, the sort of the economy that we're pioneering and emerging in, um, but also with uh, things like media and with knowledge. So you have um, YouTube, for instance, is a very collaborative environment. Uh, you have Wikipedia, which is probably the world's best example of knowledge sharing. Um, and so today I want to walk you through that. So um, I'm Christopher. Uh, I joined the company uh, a little over two years ago in the summer of 2009. Um, originally moved to San Francisco uh, to launch my own company. Um, I met the founders of Airbnb and I realized very, very early on, been following the company basically since its inception in uh, the fall of 2008. Uh, I emailed the founders and got to know them a bit and actually sent them an email. I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from the email, um, which is why I decided to forego doing my own business uh, in order to join what I think is one of the, you know, uh, going to be one of the most important companies. pocas ocasiones en las que aparecen startups realmente sorprendentes que son capaces de de cambiar sus modelos de negocio o de crear eh, nuevos ¿no? y, y Airbnb es una de ellas eh, lo que, como comunidad que son en estos momentos una comunidad en la que eres capaz de alquilar no solo apartamentos sino pisos eh, barcos, castillos islas, mansiones de repente han dado la vuelta a una forma de cómo estamos abriendo la puerta de nuestras casas hacia, hacia, otros, hacia otros usuarios En solo tres años han sido capaces de tener en estos momentos una de estas empresas que ha conseguido posicionarse en ese reducido club de las valoraciones superiores a los eh, mil millones de dólares, donde hay solo pocas como Twitter, como Facebook o Inga. Pero también eh, lo que nos va a contar es cómo somos capaces de construir una comunidad eh, para transmitir la confianza que los usuarios puedan eh, disfrutar y abrir las puertas a otros usuarios. Cristo. I hope you were saying nice things about me. So, um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here in Madrid. Um, and, and today I want to share with you uh, some of the lessons that we've learned as a company um, over time. Uh, a lot of